This video is sponsored by NordPass. More about them later in the video. One of the hardest areas that you can focus on as a structural engineer is the stability of buildings. It's a field where new ideas are constantly evolving and new concepts are being introduced. Or even the repair of buildings after a major event can cost billions of dollars. So there's a lot of money and research gone into it to make sure that it's up to the state of the art. And we can see this with all the studies that are going in currently from Turkey, but also from past events such as Christchurch, where we had a lot of additional learnings from those events that produces more safer, more efficient structures that we have today. Despite our best efforts, no building can ever be earthquake proof. My name's Renan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. You see, when we design structures, especially large events such as earthquake or hurricanes, tornadoes, they're all based on a certain return period. As we wanna make sure that we're designing efficient buildings wherever they are in the world. We don't wanna make sure that we're designing the most rigorous earthquake structures in places where it's unlikely to have an earthquake event. As it's based on statistics, it means that sometimes that we can underpredict an earthquake event, so it means no building is ever safe, as you may have a bigger event than what the building has been designed for. It doesn't mean that the engineer hasn't done their job, it just means that an unexpected event of a certain size has been designed. You see, you've got two levels of earthquake. You've got your design level of earthquake, which is your DBE, but then you've got an MCE earthquake. So you need to make sure that your buildings are safe, both in the design level, or the MCE earthquake, which is the maximum considered earthquake for your local area. The building doesn't need to be in good condition, it just needs to not collapse and have a majority of the building's life safety. But it's also not every single building. See, a certain percentage of the buildings can still collapse and can still consider it to be a safe design. As if we were to throw everything into that structure, although it may be safe, it would lead to a building cost to be exponentially more. As it's quite a complex topic, I'll be going through some of the basics that you need to understand, but make sure you stick around to the end because I'll go through some of the new research where they're reinventing how you stabilize a building, leading to more efficient buildings that are also low damage. So it's really the best of both worlds. So what are some of the basic things that you need to consider when considering the stability of a building? The first debate is about ductility. Now, whenever you're designing an earthquake, it's all considered what ductility can you apply to the building? Ductility is the difference between either a stiff structure, if you've got a low ductility building, or a flexible structure. And there's really two schools of thought about this. See, places back in Japan started to consider really conservative results where they were favoring more the stiffest building so it can survive more of an earthquake and not see a lot of damage after that event. It does mean you're chasing forces. It means that the building gets a lot bigger heavier and you need to have bigger footings to resist the loads that the building is going to see. Is you need to make sure the building is still elastic during those extreme events, making really high forces as there's no way to dissipate the load. The problem with a more ductile building pretty much equals more damage as you're allowing the building to be damaged and that force to be dissipated during that event. But it means that your forces can be significantly less. This is where we get into the discussion about hierarchy of strengths. It's about ranking the different types of strengths and how you want a building to actually fail. As you want to fail a building in a controlled way, is you've got two types of failure mechanisms. Either got a ductile failure, which is more like your flexural reaction, which can be controlled, or you have a shear failure, which can be quite strong, but is instantaneous and brittle, means that you don't have very little warning and no dissipation of forces before it actually occurs. So you wanna make sure that you have enough capacity, especially in a shear governed situation, to make sure that you don't have that shear failure and failing in a favorable way, means you can have control and see the damage actually occurring before the catastrophic event. Another consideration when looking at hierarchy of failure is also failing in the correct location. You see, if you're failing in a place like a connection or a joint, this can be quite catastrophic as you can have an instantaneous failure that causes more damage beyond the area that it actually is. Where if you have a failure in a wall in a tension boundary zone, that's more controlled and there's still other ways that the load can travel. So it's looking at the different mechanisms and different locations of failing and strengthening the right ones to make sure you don't have catastrophic failure. For example, if you have one column, you take that one column out and every single floor above it comes down, similar to what had happened at Roman Point. So they had a considerable amount of damage from a little event. Now, another area where this really comes into highlight is things such as boundary zones or hinge regions. Boundary zone is typically at the end of the walls where you see those peak stresses. Now you typically need to confine them more as they see higher compression loads but they also see tension action. So when the tension action tries to pull up the wall, it cracks it. So you wanna make sure that you have enough confinement that the concrete can still act after it's been cracked in the compression region when the load goes back to it. See, if you don't confine them, you potentially can have a snapping and a critical failure so you don't see the real ductility that you've actually designed for. Or in a hinge region is when you can see a lot of rotation. So you get a lot of that curvature similar to 
that same boundary zone region. So you make sure you're confining that zone more so that it has more strength and it can also held up underneath a lot more cracking as it's more a critical location for that curvature to occur. Bending and moving in that location, that hinge region, we'll see a lot more stresses in it. So it needs to be more confined so the concrete has higher strength. And when it cracks, it can hold together. So you don't have an instantaneous failure at that hinge region, which should typically need joints as well. So it's going back to the hierarchy and failure and making sure that you're moving the zones away from those critical regions and moving to a more region that will only cause a local area of damage or a local collapse in one region. So the structure fails in a controlled way. Moving to a more controlled failure is brought up the theory of fuses. And typically this happens in more earthquake prone areas where you can see quite minor events causing damage to buildings as it's quite hard in a big earthquake region that a service level event, which is a small earthquake, cause significant damage to a structure. So you wanna make sure the building is easily repairable. So typically these are done out of steel or elements that can be either bolted on and replaced like a plug and play system. So this means that you're seeing where the failure is occurring and then making sure that you can dissipate the forces out of that fuse. As that zone goes into plasticity, it will bend out of place. So we'll have a deformed structure, but you can come back to that structure, prop it back up, cut out that fuse and replace it. And the building is still good to go. So even underneath our largest event, you can still dissipate those forces and have the building easily repairable. Soft stories is also something that people often overlook and can be catastrophic if you miss it in your design. So what is a soft story? So sometimes you may think that more structure is better. It's not always the case, especially in an earthquake. As you bring up your stiffness, you potentially also bring up your loads. So for example, where these quite often occur is when you've got a podium level. So you've got a typical floor above, you've got your walls coming down, you have more walls as you have apartment blocks. So they made all the walls structural. Isn't that a good thing? Well, no. You see what that has done is increased the frequency of your building. It also means there's a lot of load traveling out of those walls. And when you get to the soft story, all those walls have been ripped as you want a big open area, a heap of columns to make a big, nice open space but it means your walls have been significantly reduced in that area. Not only have you decreased the frequency of the building, meaning that your loads have gone up, but you've also reduced the amount of structure. So load needs to transfer out of the walls around the whole building and come to a select number of walls, significantly increasing the loads. Because of this, it causes loads that are very hard to predict and typically causes buildings to pancake at that one level. This is quite often seen in a lot of buildings. We see only one floor collapse, typically the lower floor. What they typically done, they might have had a moment resistant frame, put infill walls such as masonry, in between it. That masonry is there to finish the walls and create a nice sound isolation area. But what it's also done is stiffen up the whole building. Essentially, you've got a frame with a rigid block in place that significantly stiffens up the building, allowing for a shear transfer to go through the infill wall. But as you've gone down, you go to the lowest floor where you've tried to open everything up. Instead of still having that infill wall, you've removed it. So you've created a significantly stiffer structure above to a soft story below, causing that catastrophic failure. Another area that is also quite often overlooked is the stiffness of your floor. A lot of people don't consider it a stiff floor is good. It allows you to transfer load from your floor diaphragm to your walls. But this has a negative effect sometimes. We see when the walls rock backwards and forwards, a slab needs to bend as well. So you've got a stiff structure, you start to see this S-shaped structure and starts to stiffen up the whole structure. The structure is not actually failing as you were predicted as the walls not bending as needed. So it can cause some peak stresses on the front and the back of the structure and causes a lot of additional cracking. So quite often, if you've made that really stiff floor, you can actually have a negative effect. It's actually pushing you away from that flexural failure and being more of a shear dominated condition. So when you're detailing your floor connections, not only do you need to watch out for those hinges, but if you also made it too stiff, as it might be better to make those locations more flexible to allow the structure to rock backwards and forwards. So despite wanting to have the diaphragm stiffly connected to your lateral system. If you made the location too stiff, it can also have negative impact on your building, meaning the building's not actually failing in the way that you've actually predicted. The ground conditions also have a big impact. Now there's nothing you can do about those ground conditions where you are, so you need to make sure you've always got a geotechnical report to know what the underlying soil is. You see a rock structure doesn't have a lot of amplification, so it can have a lot smaller earthquake. But if you've got a deep soft soil, what happens is the waves reflect off the top of the soil and bounce back up and down amplifying the earthquake, acting like a jello, so increasing the force the building needs to see. Another thing that you may not have thought about is the ground turning to liquid. Well, this is commonly known as liquefaction. Essentially what happens during an earthquake, your water table is high and it rises up. And as the ground shakes, 
It makes the ground more liquid as it's jostling around the soil components, turning your ground into liquid effectively, allowing buildings to settle into the structure. We can see that the structures overneath are slowly sinking into the sand. Now to get around this, you potentially do need to put some piles down to more stiffer soil below the area of influence on that liquefaction. So the building can essentially sit up on stilts as the ground below it liquefies, meaning your building won't sink into the ground. Obviously, if building sinks into the ground, it does mean that major repairs need to happen. Another common practice that you can have a look at when trying to resist the lateral forces is seeing if you can isolate your building from those actions rocking backwards and forwards or dissipate the forces in another way. So you can either look at having a base isolation system or a tune mass dampener system. Well, the base isolation system, as it sounds, essentially isolating you from those rocking forces. This can be done in a number of different ways. It means that as the force rocks backwards and forwards, so your building sees a significantly less impact from that earthquake. Essentially, as the ground slides underneath, the building stays somewhat where it is. There will be some effects of it rocking backwards and forwards, but it's greatly dissipated by the base isolation that you have in the structure. Now, tune mass dampeners act in a different way. It's quite hard to use them in an earthquake condition, but buildings such as Taipei 101 implement this design perfectly. See what happens, you can also do this in a different way to help dissipate the forces. Dampener in there, there's essentially a big weight that helps counterbalance those actions, helping dissipate the forces of the building rocks backwards and forwards, meaning that you see significantly less loads. It's essentially dissipating some of those actions through the laws of momentum. So typically a tune mass damp you need it on a bigger building as it's quite hard to implement in smaller structures where base isolation happens in a lot of buildings. So typically if your building needs to be undamaged and still operational after a big event such as police stations or hospitals is where they look down the base isolation solution as it typically means that you need double foundations and completely isolate the building from the ground floor. So it's normally a more expensive way to address it. But as I was saying, there is a new way. So there's constant research gone into this area to see whether we can have a more efficient design that both leads to low damage, but also an efficient way of using the structure. So can you still dissipate those forces? Thank you NordPass for sponsoring this video. NordPass is a password management system for businesses. It allows you to share your most secure data, whether that be passwords or payment information, with the highest cybersecurity protocols today. Password management and making sure that your staff is using the most secure passwords at hand can be really time consuming for all staff. So if you're having to log into things quite regularly, it's quite hard to remember the more complex passwords, meaning that your data is more secure. And NordPass takes this off your hands with this secure system. It allows you to share that secure data efficiently, easily, quickly at the touch of your fingertips. Something that people quite often don't look, only really think about passwords. But payment information can also hold you up in a big time. So if someone needs to make a fast secure payment to get access to something, if they don't have quick control of the company accounts, it can delay days or weeks as the approval process goes through. However, NordPass offers you a quick and easy way to share that information to give access to when people need it. In addition to providing a password management system, they also have a data breach scanning system. So it means they scan whenever your data has been leaked. So whenever that occurs, you can quickly jump on top of it to making sure that the damage is at the minimal point possible. And you might even be able to pick it up before any damage actually occurs. So NordPass is offering a three month free trial to businesses with the link in the below description and using the following code, which means that you can try it risk free and see how it goes and see whether it actually suits you and your operation. So what have you got to lose? Now let's get back to the content. This is where the research has come into a rocking system. So what is it? It allows the building to rock or a specific part of the building to rock instability, rock backwards and forwards. So the walls essentially lift off the ground. For the building to actually go back, you need a corrective action. And this is where you have big tension rods typically through the middle of it. So as the building rocks backwards and forwards, those tension rods extend, but then it allows it to self-correct by pulling it back into place. As you specifically made the building and detailed in such a way that it's rocking backwards and forwards, meaning there's not much cracking as the building is dissipating its force through momentum and the rocking system in that wall. There is some critical areas that you need to watch out for when looking at such rocking systems. You can see this in many papers that have been published. It's similar to that stiff floor that we talked about before. See, the stiff floor won't allow that structure to rock backwards and forwards if it's solidly attached to the building. So typically you need to either have it detached completely from the gravity system and just have it there for the lateral system or making sure that the load of the gravity is occurring through the middle of that structure. So right through the middle where you don't see very much movement. So it won't have much effect from that rocking backwards and forwards. Now it typically needs some sort of hinge or rotation to also means that the floor is staying still 
as the wall is tilting over. But it doesn't mean that you need to have careful detailing around those locations because you still need to transfer all the shear through that wall. So it means that you can have both a building that is ductile or in a controlled way in that flexural action and allowing for the forces to dissipate. It's self-correcting, so it means that it can self-align, but also means that your building has a low damage as typically you only have one wall potentially where you have some damage that you need to repair as the rest of the structure is just going along for the ride. So you detail everyone else for the movement that that structure was gonna see. So whether you're in a small earthquake region or high earthquake region, you can see significant savings by adopting this approach. Precast is also another area which is perfect for a rocking system as you can strengthen the building in those specific ways and concrete is quite good in acting underneath those compression and movement forces. But there is certain other things that you need to consider when designing a precast building. Now I've got the rules of precast design that you need to consider here. They'll help bring your precast up to the next level. And if you combine this with a rocking system, you'll not only have a more efficient, safe structure and your clients will love you for it as you'll have a big open spaces. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube or Patreon members, this type of content will not be possible. As always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.